I'll admit everybody from the waiting room. Welcome everybody. Thank you for your patience as we are just in the process of admitting everybody into uh, our room. And Liz will let me know when everybody is in and uh, we will begin. All right, we've got everyone admitted. Thank you, Liz. Vicki, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Vicki Kelly, for that beautiful um, flute presentation calling upon the four directions as we begin our webinar. My name is Karen Ragutti. Welcome. And before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that UBC Okanagan, on which I'm situated, is on the unceded territories of the Silks Okanagan Nation. Et ceux d'entre vous qui viennent d'ailleurs, je vous prie de considérer les terres ancestrales et traditionnelles sur lesquelles vous êtes rassemblés. So once again, welcome um, to the Center for Mindful Engagement, our webinar series. The Center for Mindful Engagement is a research center situated in the Okanagan School of Education on the o UBC Okanagan's campus. Our research center is involved, uh, apart from research activities with graduate students, faculties, but also community engagement. So this is part of our community engagement. And if you would like any more information in regards to the CMEs, we call it, please do visit our our website situated in the Okanagan School of Education. So today um, we are very pleased uh, to be uh, launching, uh, doing a book launch, recognizing the work of our colleague, Dr. Virginie Magna. Um, and at the same time, we will also be hearing from presentations from a very special group of people, uh, a group of interdisciplinary and artists uh, internationally based. Um, we have uh, who are part of a research initiative that Virginie and I are part of called the UBC Eminence Research Cluster, uh, an excellence looking at culture, creativity, health and well-being. So after Virginie's book launch, which she'll be talking about the performative power of vocality, we'll be hearing from Dr. Vicky Kelly, who is part of this interdisciplinary research uh, group. Uh, Dr. Vicky Kelly is an associate professor at Simon Fraser University here in Vancouver. And uh, we will also be hearing from Dr. Nathalie Artois from University, sorry, Nathalie Gotard, sorry, from University d'Artois in France as well, who will also be sharing uh, her work with us as well. 
Just so we have an idea in terms of how our webinar will progress, each one of our guests will speak for around 20 minutes. We do have time for a question and answer period. And I'd also like to introduce Liz Saville, who is just give a quick wave, Liz, uh, who will be moderating the Q&A session. So please feel free to put your questions up in the chat, or if you feel comfortable, you know, we will have a Q&A after our presentations, and uh, Liz will be uh, moderating that. I think that is all the information that we need so far. So without any further ado, I'd like to pass this on uh, to Dr. Virginie Magna, um, knowing that this is a book launch for her uh, much anticipated book, The Performity, Power of Vocality. So please go ahead, Virginie. Thank you so much, Karen. I really appreciate it. I wanted to thank uh, Vicky Kelly, uh, as you will see, she is one of the collaborators, uh, very important collaborators on uh, the projects that I discuss in my book. And I wanted to thank her for um, the flute that she played to open our, our session. Um, so thank you so much, Vicky, for that. That was really grounding and um, helpful. My book is about vocality and sound and music. So <laughs> that was a great way to uh, open. Um, and so to continue in that, in that uh, spirit, um, Here's something like that too. Nam traversa naulanes, nam traversa naulanes, nam patruva bruni brana sun timra nun. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and uh, I wanted to uh, first show a beautiful, beautiful painting, which is the frontispiece of my book. Um, and as you can see, um, it's uh, titled Powwow Singers. It's by Daphne Ojig. Um, and it's, um, Daphne Ojig is a very, very important indigenous uh, artist uh, from Canada. Um, and um, I just wanted to acknowledge the permission of Daphne Ojig, Ojig's son, Stan Somerville, and the owners of the painting, Dan and Michael uh, Timiansky, and also the beautiful photo made by my husband, Robert Ornelas. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to share this beautiful painting with you because um, because it is owned uh, by uh, um, uh, privately. Um, it, you don't get to see me it maybe so often, and it's a beautiful, beautiful um, rendering of uh, people singing in community and from an indigenous perspective. So I wanted to share that with you because that's an important aspect of my book. And uh, yes, I want to just give you a little bit of an overview uh, of uh, what's, what's, uh, what I did in my book. Uh, it's basically a book that's addressed to qualitative researchers um, and artist scholars, as well as activists committed to decolonization, cultural revitalization and social justice. And what it does, which is a bit paradoxical because it's a book uh, written in printed words on pages, you know, and you can, there's an ebook version as well, but, it actually explores the non-verbal, non-semantic, non-discursive material and affective efficacy of vocality with a particular focus on orally transmitted vocal tradition. So what I just did now is I shared with you a traditional song, a, a very short fragment of a traditional song from Occitania, from my tradition. And I'm, I'm assuming that most of you, including myself, don't speak Occitan, the Occitan language, which is actually a critically endangered language, um, but it, it is still transmitted through songs and some people still speak it. I don't, it hasn't been transmitted to me. So this was an example of when someone sings a song and you don't understand the words, the language, you still get something from it, hopefully. And that's what my book is about. <laughs> um, and really, I wrote this book in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action addressed to researchers and educators, so all of us. Um, and I seek to open a dialogical space in that book that's inclusive and respectful of indigenous ontologies, epistemologies, and methodologies. I draw from my research collaboration with the Indigenous Advisory Committee formed 
for this project. And Dr. Vicky Kelly, Kelly is one of the indigenous uh, scholars who's a member of that advisory committee. So I'm very honored and happy to have her uh, with us today. Uh, it's very important uh, for me that she's here. And I also know that I think some uh, of my collaborators uh, are uh, also here today. So I just wanted to welcome everyone. Um, it also builds on the work of uh, important indigenous scholars such as Vine Deloria Jr., Gregory Cajete, Linda Tuiwi Smith, Sean Wilson, Margaret Kovach, Manulani Anuli Meyer, Jill Carter, Dylan Robinson, and Dolly Manning, among other indigenous scholars. I wanted to acknowledge their work. Um, and I just say that I consider in this, in this book, I consider vocality from a multiplicity of perspectives offered by indigenous and Western philosophy as well as sound and voice studies, musicology, ethnomusicology, performance studies, anthropology, sociology, phenomenology, cognitive science, physics, ecology, and biomedicine. From an indigenous perspective, singing uh, traditional songs requires being in relation with the voices of ancestors and the natural world, as cultural knowledge is shared within and across communities inclusive of other or more than human agents. So the performative power of vocality uh, offers an interdisciplinary and cross-cultural approach to vocality beyond notions of voice as a conceptual abstraction or a metaphor and beyond its association with speech and language, making vocality exclusively human, hence problematically anthropocentric. I discuss my embodied research on vocality that entails relearning the songs of my Occitan ancestors. So that's why I shared this uh, very brief um, example of my relearning songs uh, in the Occitan language. And I ask how experiencing resonance as relationality and reciprocity might strengthen relationship to our community and our natural environment, enhance health and well being reconnect us to our cultural heritage and foster intercultural understanding and social justice. Um, and I want to acknowledge SHRC, uh, um, the uh, uh, Social Sciences and uh, Humanities Research Council of Canada for uh, uh, providing uh, grants that were uh, foundational to, uh, to the work that I did um, for example, with the Indigenous uh, Advisory Committee and the four graduate students who were graduate research assistants on this uh, project. Um, so in chapter one, I, I, I begin by, uh, uh, by speaking about a project called Honoring, Honoring uh, Cultural Diversity Through Collective Vocal Practice. And this is a project that was done in close uh, uh, consultation and collaboration with the seven members of the Indigenous Advisory Committee. Uh, um, and uh, as I said, Dr. Vicky Kelly is uh, one of these members and she's with us today. Um, it was a series of cross-cultural and intergenerational community gatherings and workshops. They were co-facilitated by all of us, uh, including the four graduate students. Um, and so uh, what I do is in the first chapter, I share some selected fragments of a co-authored text that we uh, created together uh, the 12 of us, uh, in which we braided our voices together as a way of searching for echoes and resonances while leaving space for dissonances. So it's a collaborative testimony of our experience of resonance as a practice of ritual engagement, which reflects the challenges of working together towards reconciliation, pointing to something other than unanimity, unison, perfect harmony. Um, so I want to take you uh, just briefly to, uh, to give you a, 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 just a, a, a little bit of a, an idea of what uh, that uh, uh, co-authored text is like. It is a plurivocal, dialogical, and performative text. And I just want to acknowledge the authors who are um, the seven members of uh, the Indigenous Advisory Committee, um, two uh, Silks Okanagan, interdisciplinary artists who were uh, the GRAs, uh, graduate students from UBC Okanagan, and two graduate students from uh, UBC Vancouver. So you see their names here. Um, and we have a film that I really encourage you to uh, go watch because it's very short, it's only 15 minutes, and it's posted on the UBC Institute for Community Engaged Research. Uh, it's a film about a retreat we did in the Okanagan 
and so a workshop uh, uh, at SFU that we co-facilitated uh, gives you a good sense of some of the things we did together. Oh, and also uh, we are gathering at, UBC, at the UBC Vancouver uh, Longhouse, um, First Nations Longhouse, a beautiful space. Um, this is a photo of our group, um, and then you also uh, there's also a beautiful photo of us at the Naukin Center. Uh, this is an important photo because it includes Carolyn Kenny, an indigenous scholar of uh, music therapy who uh, passed away um, um, and was one of the uh, uh, members of the Indigenous Advisory Committee and we dedicated our um, co-authored text to her. Um, and also uh, Dr. Greg Younging who also passed away, uh, who was there with us on that day at the Inalkin Center in Penticton. We had special guests, Sean Wilson, uh, you can see him in the back, Graham Smith, who's Linda Tuiwe Smith's husband, and he's a very important education scholar, Maori education scholar, and then all the members of our uh, advisory committee and our four graduate students were all there. And then a beautiful photo of us having a wonderful dinner together <laughs> uh, with Sean Wilson and Manuel Yaluni Meyer, a um, uh, Hawaiian scholar who is also part of our, uh, our group uh, at the front here, looking very happy. Uh, so I just wanted to share that because it's also uh, an important aspect of research is relationships and um, and uh, yeah and uh, I I want to make sure that I honor um, these relationships um, which is what I, I do in my book. So um, just to take you back to chapter one, what I also do in chapter one is I uh, share a little bit about uh, the teachings of Zygmunt Molik, uh, the voice specialist in Jerzy Gutowski's laboratory theater. Uh, he's, uh, this is a very important group uh, of um, um, experimental theater uh, that uh, was based in Poland, but that worked with people from all over the world. Uh, that's where my training comes from. Um, and so uh, Monique's uh, voice work focuses on the body-voice connection, organicity, vibration, and resonance. And these notions are central to my training as a performance practitioner and to my embodied research on vocabulary. So these examples of vocal practice uh, prompt a discussion about the paradoxical lack of attention to vocality in performance studies and the necessity to develop an interdisciplinary and cross-cultural approach that tries to avoid as much as possible what Dwight Conkergood boldly categorizes as Western textual fundamentalism or what he calls also scriptocentrism and that Diana Taylor characterizes as privileging the archive over the repertoire. She has a very famous book called The Archive and the Repertoire. And Conke Good and Taylor are a very important performance study scholar um, uh, in my field. Um, so heeding some of the things they say about text uh, and performance is really important for me. Uh, so I'm really building on their work. And then uh, towards the end, uh, we're called to bear witness to the decolonial space of indigenous epistemologies that promote embodied sovereignty beyond the essentialism constructionism binaries of Western theories, a space where traditional singing pertains to ceremonial art and transformative cultural practices that is vocality with breath, spirit, living energy and mystery. In chapter two, I'm so happy this is working because I've had problems with Zoom before trying to experiment with this, but it's working. I'm happy and grateful. <laughs> in chapter two, um, so I track uh, anthropology's colonial legacy in the development of ethnography, which initially was a methodology designed to make the practices of the other, with a capital O, legible to the West by translating embodiment and orality into scholarly writing. I argue that when the voice is reduced to conceptual abstraction or a metaphor through the visualist and textualist theoretical frameworks of scriptocentrism. So what Dwight Conkergood speaks about. Um, what gets lost in translation is the sonorous and sensuous materiality of vocality. This is also why I, I offered a small fragment of a traditional song in a language that you most likely don't understand because uh, that's what I'm trying to, um, um, to explore. Um, to probe uh, what philosopher Adriana Cavarero calls the de-vocalization of logos, and she's a very important philosopher in vocality and a specialist of ancient Greek, um, uh, um, the ancient Greek world. I invite the reader to embark on an imaginary visit to ancient Greece and take part in a performative ethnographic encounter with Ion, a skilled rhapsodist and vocal expert whom Plato 
attempts to silence in his text titled Iron. Building on Cabrero's cogent reassessment of Jacques Derrida's influential critique of voice and presence, at least very influential in performance studies for sure, I examine possible implications for research on vocality and suggest that Roland Barthes' passionate engagement with vocal music entices us to delight in the non-discursive sensory experience of vocality beyond the tyranny of signification. These are his words. He's a famous semiologist who was really interested in text and words, but who uh, uh, learned how to uh, sing with a, uh, uh, um, a master practitioner who used traditional songs. And he talks about that in his writing. He, um, he wrote the text, The Grain of the Voice, Le Grand Lavoie, which is a very famous text for voice studies uh, and sound studies. So I discussed that, I engaged with, with his writing about vocal music. And then I further contend that uh, becoming immersed in the material affective efficacy of vocality summoned by somebody else who's quite famous in performance studies and theater history, Antonin Artaud. Antonin Artaud's alchemical theater, which mobilizes the transformative power of breath, energy, and vibration, can provide important insights into his visionary attempt to emancipate performance from the dominance of speech and text in support of the non-representational intensification of presence. This chapter culminates with Arto's trip to Mexico, a journey in search of healing um, that he evokes in a testimony for grounding the agential role of sound, music, and song as affective material forces uh, within the peyote ceremonial uh, process, which he claims he experienced when visiting the Tarahumara. And so if you want to know more about that, there is a, um, a button that you can click and it's a, um, it's a recording of a talk I gave this summer um, uh, for the 2020 Poundman, uh, Poundmaker Indigenous Performance Festival, directed and organized and curated by my colleague and friend Floyd Favel, a Cree um, theater maker, writer, director, and actor who worked with a number of very important uh, um, theater innovators, including Jerzy Gotowski uh, in Poland, um, and who is, uh, uh, practices the ceremonial uh, peyote practice that um, Arto was interested in. So um, it was a very a great honor to uh, speak about that uh, at his festival. In chapter three, um, Chapter three is interesting. Uh, it's called Exploring New Paradigm with a K. And that's something I borrowed from Manuelani Alumi Meyer, uh, who uh, herself borrowed it from a, a Maori uh, graduate student uh, who was writing a dissertation and used this term. Uh, and you'll understand why. Uh, chapter three explores the potential uh, of the new materialist and posthumanist paradigm shift for conducting research on vocality beyond the limitations of post structuralism and the dominance of anthropocentrism. This requires critically engaging with affect theory, neuroscience, and quantum physics, investigating different conceptualizations of non-human agency, and identifying points of convergence and divergence between indigenous philosophy and post-humanism, new materialism, to account for the relational dimension of vocality. So in contrast with Karen Barrett's new materialist perspective, um, indigenous scholars, Vine Deloria Jr., Manulani Aluhi Mayer, and Gregory Cajete, among others, of course, foreground the non separability of materiality and spirituality within the complex ecology of human and other more than human relations. This is also reflected in Dylan Robinson's analysis of doing sovereignty through the affective politics, vibrance, vibrancy, and efficacy of idol no more song actions as well as in uh, Doreen Manning's critique of new materialist and post-humanist scholars for appropriating indigenous understandings of the affective potency of material existence that encompasses traditional stories and songs considered to have their own agency. This potent living materiality is evoked by indigenous architect Douglas Cardinal, who designed the National Museum of the American Indian for the Smithsonian Institution, the Canadian Museum of Civilization, as well as the Nelkin Center. And you saw the Nelkin Center in that photo where we're all gathered uh, together. Um, 
And he, um, Cardinal, interestingly, uh, uh, gained, uh, talks about gaining a life-changing knowledge from a vision quest during which he became fully aware of his interconnectedness to all living things. So I refer to, to that as well. Um, I infer that indigenous ethical principles of relationality, reciprocity, and responsibility that bind human and non-human agents to each other may be said to offer a truly radical, if not new, eco-critical consciousness that clearly addresses the crucial questions raised by post-humanist and new materialist, materialist scholars. Finally, in chapter four, um, I ask uh, questions um, that are questions we can all ask ourselves, I think, and there are no answers to these questions. Um, but I think it's still important to ask them. Have we inherited the instinct, need, or desire to hum, chant, and sing from our most distant human ancestors? If so, how did they develop this vocal propensity and why? What can be achieved through singing that cannot be achieved through language? Can reactivating a traditional song in the present moment of performance reconnect the singer to those who sang that song for the first time? I address these questions um, through the convergence of musicology, paleoanthropology, neuroscience, phenomenology, and performance studies. Musicologist Gary Tomlinson's hypothesis of the co-evolutionary biocultural emergence of music and language serves as the basis for challenging language-centric evolutionary theories of cognition that fail to account for singing since tonality, timbre, and melodic contour are neither language-like nor symbol-like. I then consider Jerzy suggestion that the non-representational performative processes pertaining to source techniques, including traditional singing, may enable us to experience consciousness not linked to language, but to presence, as if activating an embodied ancestral relation to those who sang the first traditional songs. This practice-based understanding of a connection between presence and consciousness achieved through doing is corroborated by Alva Noe's phenomenological reclamation of presence in a, as a vital aspect of non-representational modalities of knowledge by which we gain access to the world. To ground these alternative conceptions of presence and consciousness and creative agency in a specific vocal tradition, I invite the reader to travel to Occitania and meet Pere Boissier, a respected traditional singer specializing in the orally transmitted Occitan vocal tradition, which resonates with, with the, voice, uh, the voices sorry, of my ancestors. Um, so this, the fragment of song I shared with you uh, it, it is a song that Pei Boissier collected uh, through the collectage uh, uh, ethnographic method of um, meeting with elders and recording some of the songs and stories. Um, and all these elders, of course, passed away. That happened in the 70s and 80s in France and then singing these songs again and transmitting them to the next generation. Um, this, uh, the resurgence of this oral culture has served as a source of agency and resistance for Occitan music revitalization in France, a radical form of cultural activism that defies nationalist ideology rooted in France's colonial history. Something that I write about in a couple of articles, one in French and one in English that you can find on my website. Oops, Virginie, I think Virginie has frozen. In a very progressive oh, yes. manner, which has not always been the case, especially in France. As we return to Canada at the end of my book, uh, our journey uh, comes full circle at the Nelkin Center uh, with a unique cross-cultural encounter between two vocal traditions from different continents. And what happened is that by chance, uh, Manu Theron, one of the Occitan music specialists I, uh, I learned from, I worked with, yep. Virginie, if you can okay. hear me, we, we can still hear you. It's just getting a little warbled and your visual is okay. So I think we have lost Virginie. Um, we will try to get back in touch with her. Um, this happens often, as we know, <laughs> dealing with Zoom. Uh, and there she is. She's back. Okay, Virginie. I was just finishing. So that's perfect. I'm just going to conclude. 
uh, so what I was talking about is that um, at the, uh, uh, one of the things that we did. I think we will conclude and when Virginie comes with uh, my indigenous collaborators, some of my indigenous collaborators at the Inaukin Center and to sing together. That was a beautiful moment uh, and it's not been recorded, it's in our memories. <laughs> um, but um, Virginie, thank you very much. We, we are just um, have ex experiencing really technical problems. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much. Congratulations on the launch of your book. And, uh, you know, in particular for sharing this really wonderful, innovative, uh, you know, um, uh, theory and presentations, artistic representations about the power of voice. I think as we think back on your book, we can all think about songs and hums and chants that have informed our childhoods and our own backgrounds and really understand, you know, the power behind them. So thank you for that. Without, yes, thanks. <laughs> Without much further ado, I'd like to now introduce uh, Dr. Vicki Kelly, Associate Professor from Simon Fraser University, who will uh, be talking to us about her work and her research and her artistic expressions and how she incorporates them uh, into her day-to-day -day life. Go ahead, Vicki. Uh, Vicki, you have to unmute. My apologies. I was being a good participant and muting myself, so... Ani, greetings from the, um, the traditional territory of the Serpent River Anishinaabe uh, Nation here in the northern part of uh, what we call Eastern Ontario above Georgian Bay. Um, I'm here on a study leave and so I'm not in my normal abode in uh, Vancouver, um, but I'm home. And so I'm speaking to you from a place of homeness uh, with the ecology that I grew up with uh, and to which I feel very honored to be back with. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, this event and Virginie's work. And I'm pleased uh, in my screen that I can see Winston uh, sitting there um, with us, who was also a very, very important uh, knowledge holder and vo uh, vocal practitioner uh, from Virginie's work, and so I'm honored that he is here. I want to again um, um, play a little bit just to just set the tone a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I'll be getting up and down because I just have to play a little bit standing here. So I'm going to speak about sound. So what I'm playing is what we traditionally call the Native American flute. It's a wind instrument and it has a, a totem, a being that inspires the voice. And in this particular one, it's a Zuni bear. And you can see there's a heart line going from the wind, the mouth, to inspire the heart. And then a traditional player doesn't play a song. They play in place. And at the very end of the flute are these four holes, which are the four direction holes. And these four holes is how we tune ourselves and the instrument to place. So in other words, we acknowledge that we are in an ecology both environmental and spiritual. We acknowledge that the sound lives between the spiritual ecology of a place and the natural ecology of a place. And that as human beings, we are per participating in the pedagogy of, of, of this polyphonic world. In other words, in my tradition, we would say that Anishinaabe came to earth to learn the teachings from the relatives and to be a good relative. How? By holding the teachings as they are given. 
in other words, to be so resonant that they are accommodated in our humanness as they are given. So when I began the practice of playing the flute, I have to tell you I began in my closet. In other words, I had to make sure no one was listening. I imported the flute and I played in my apartment uh, very quietly in the corner, far away from the doors and windows, uh, making sure that no one could hear, hear the muffled chirping of a so-called professor in there doing weird things. And so I um, played and I made a rule that I would wake up every morning and play to the seven directions as a practice. And that I would be in the discipline of wind. The wind clan was the clan of the flute players in the ancient ways. And they played in place as a knowledge practice. So I arose every morning and played to the directions. And I made this one rule that I couldn't play the same tune that I had to improvise each and every morning. In other words, I had to be available. I had to tune myself. And I did this because I was struggling as an Indigenous scholar to find my way in the academy with what I believed was a new vision of possibility. And I, like many of my colleagues, and as Robin Wall Kimmer says, we walked backwards, we turned and walked backwards along the path of our ancestors to take up the practices that would reshape our humanity to make us available to the teachings of our ancestors so that we could do good work in our time. Work that required an acknowledgement that humanity stands ideally in a circle of knowledges and that our knowledges and our traditions are one of these many knowledges in the circle of life and in the circle of knowledge. And that we have a rightful place. And that we as Indigenous scholars are walking back along those trails of our ancestors and picking up the broken pieces of song, knowledge and practice and reanimating them. Why? to make and unmake ourselves so that we become vision, become enabled to envision a possibility for education and our world that is holistic, that honors our indigeneity to earth, and that creates a possibility for all our relations to walk towards wellness, well-being. We live in a time where all of these things are in jeopardy. And as Robin and many of my colleagues will say, Greg, many Manu, the consciousness that gave rise to the issues is not the consciousness that will give rise to the visions for the healing and the well-being. So in my programs, in my work with Indigenous students and non-Indigenous students, we take up practices, land practice. We take up praxis, the making of traditional art forms, like I did with the flute. We, we play the drum, we flute, we take up art practices, weaving, metalwork, carving. Why? So that we learn from these processes in a pedagogical encounter and that this pedagogy shapes and reshapes us, our humanness. And so in that indigenous pedagogy, which is participatory, we have a potentiality of finding other capacities to walk forward. In other words, we can wash our eyes, rinse our ears, and open our hearts to other kinds of teachings from our relations, all of our relations. So what I want to share with you is that I did that practice. I didn't even know what I was doing. And eventually I brought it into my classroom and then I realized that when I play my flute, the space changes because it acoustically rings and my students' ears open because it's a different frequency. And so that opening through sound, that sonic opening of our hearts creates a different listening. And what are we really looking for is to be listening to the world, to be deeply resonant with the world. 
Knowledge holders, and we have one amongst us, are people who hold the knowledge as it was given so that they are still resonant with the ecology that gave it. That's a knowledge holder whose knowledge is living in an ecological relationality to the world from which it was given. Hmm, that's a fine, fine tradition. And how do we find ways of enacting that? It's a little bit like Le Virginie's leap of faith. When she invited us all together and said, okay, how should we be doing this? And we ended up in the coulee, a bunch of strangers, singing around a fire. And the whole space was verberating with scree songs and uh, all the various uh, people brought their songs. And all of our ears were hearing all these acoustic ecologies coming from our ancestors. And it was one of those moments where I was cracked open because the sounding of the voices of our ancestors was animating our hearts and ears again. In other words, by gifting a song to the circle, we were creating a pedagogy for listening to the ancient voices, to the other way of being that sounds through these songs. Not long afterwards, we had a very large, very, very moving ceremony in the Tsleil-Waututh territory where I live. We honored the passing of one of our greatest chiefs, Leonard George, the son of Chief Dan George. And if you're Canadian, you know this is a very important family. And this room, this great hall, was filled with hundreds and hundreds of indigenous singers and knowledge keepers, artists. And the whole event was done through song. All the ceremony was done through song. There wasn't words, there was songs. And there was 30 drummers standing in the front, drumming so that everything shook and that we were ver reverberating. Why? Because we were dissolving the crystallized grief that lived within ourselves. And over the course of two hours, and all the singing and the procession and the ceremony, we left and we walked and accompanied this great chief to his final resting place through the streets, singing, sounding one of the most important songs of their nation. And so that sounding, that was an experience of how the ancestors knew that in our cellular metabolism, we resonate, we entrain with the ecologies in which we, with which we live. In other words, our cellular level entrains in sound. That's the contemplative healing practices of chanting and singing and ringing, is that we are reordering, reordering our cellular level to be more awake and resonant. So if you imagine this tuning to the world, this entuning to the world, that my, I must say, as an educator, I meet ed each and every day. Because each one of my students come and says, I feel cultural dissonance. I feel discord. I feel distress in the children that I greet because they are not finding a place in this world that accommodates the longing that they came with. In my world, we would say they are reaching for another vision. And these educators know that the one that we are offering them does not have that potentiality of writing the relationship of children to Mother Earth and all their relations. That's the, but that's what they're coming for. That's what they're longing for. That's what my teachers are longing for. So when they encounter indigenous knowledge traditions or practices, they find themselves gradually tuning to something that they came here for, that gives them a possibility of reimagining their educational practice, their art practice, their ecological practice. So they go to the land. They find their ceremonies, they find their arts practices, and they find their new emerging 
I'm going to call it pedagogical process. And that pedagogical process, like in myself, is offered forward to the children. I offer forward a pedagogical process that I did as a flute player, player what I did as a carver when I did a two-year apprenticeship and I went up north and I learned from the carvers of the West Coast tradition how to lift the culture through the art, how to create representations that, la that actually acknowledged and honored the spiritual ecology of the places that I was living in, the Nishka, the Simshan, the Haida traditions of visual art. And my great teacher, Dempsey Bob, said, you are here because they trodden the vision, the worldview, and the cosmology of our people underfoot. And you, as artists, are raising it up, lifting it up to a place of honor. So the artists, all artists, all nations, all cultures, are people trying to reanimate a cosmology that accommodates the human and the more than human in the spirit of our traditions. People like Mark Nepo say that we do with the working of the patterns of the, in, of the, of the specific, the understanding, the teachings of the universal. On a Schnabi way, we would say that the creator is in each and everything, and our job is to acknowledge it. Ani. Ani. How am I doing with time? I'm good? Do I have a couple of seconds? Yes, you do, absolutely, Vicky. Okay, okay. okay. So, so I'm, I've sort of um, rocked your world, but I'm gonna tell you one little uh, story, um, if I may, uh, an Anishinaabe teaching story that I think is very important. And I take it that you're here for a reason. And this story that I'm offering from my culture is to honor you uh, in your intention. Now, in our world, we have this creation story, and I'm going to jump in um, at chapter three, but I just want to give you a short little praises about how creation happened on the back of Turtle, because Turtle raised its back to accommodate Sky Woman. And Sky Woman took the earth that was offered by Muskrat, painted the turtle's back, and Turtle Island appeared. And all the relatives climbed onto Turtle Island and reanimated the creation through on Turtle Island. Sky Woman had some young ones, and these young ones were given to the all the relatives, beaver and muskrat and wolf and deer, and the relatives took care of these little ones. And the little ones were doing okay. But one day, Bear got growly as bears get growly. And growly bear started to rumble and mumble around. And everyone said, bear, what's your problem? What's your problem? Get a grip. There's something wrong with the little ones. So everyone started to pay a little bit more attention. They started to see whether they drank the milk that deer offered or ate the offerings of wolf or how that was when muskrat and beaver took them down to the river for their bath. So they eventually, after a long time of paying attention, Bear called a meeting, a gathering, and they sat in council. And the council was asking, what can we do for the little ones? Because the little ones are not thriving. So after much discussion, it was acknowledged that they would call a nanabuju. And so the word went out. <whistles> the birds took the message and they flew to the four corners of the world looking for nanabuju. Nanabuju was in a far off territory <whistles> and heard the word and came to the gathering. And they, there all the animals were sitting in council waiting for nanabuju very serious moment and he asks what on what was the matter and they told them look look at the little ones they're just sitting there so Nanabuju looked and indeed the little ones were just sitting there so he decided to make a long quest 
to ask the Creator what they could do for the little ones. And so Nanabujo headed west over the prairies to the footlands to, and began a, a fast. He, he had his last meal, made a camp, drank some water, ate some food, and in the morning climbed the mountain. And it is said that for four days and four nights he prayed to Creator, what shall we do for the little ones? What can we do for those little ones? And on the very last evening, before he began to despair, he again entreated Creator to offer him a teaching, a way of what he could take back to the, to the nation, to the, I'm going to call the animal nations, to offer as a teaching. And there came this voice, pick up all the colored stones on your way down the mountain. And so Nanabujo bent and picked up all the colored stones along the way and gathered them and sat by the fire, eating and having a bit of to drink, and sat there looking with a frown on his forehead. What was he to do with a pile of colored stones? He began actually to glare at those stones. What is Anna, what's the brothers and sisters going to think when I come with a pile of rocks? He took a handful of those stones and he began to toss them in the firelight. And then in frustration, heave them up into the night sky and they disappeared among the sparkling ones. He took each and every one of those sparkling, those colored uh, stones and threw them up into the starlight to dance among the, the sparks and fireflies. And then on the edge of the glowing of the fire, he began to see winged ones, colorful winged ones. And so as dawn appeared and he broke camp and cleaned his camp and packed up his belonging, he was heading east, surrounded by a cloud of fluttering, colored, rainbow-colored butterflies. When he arrived at the site of all the gathering of all the, the, the animal families, the nations, they were there waiting, and it was indeed a grand sight. Nana Bujo walking in, surrounded by a cloud of butterflies. And then the little ones, they began to look, and they began to check and try to catch these cheeky little ones. And they began to, to reach and to get up on their knees and try to kind of grabbed the hold of those little fluttering little ones that came up nice and close and then fluttered away. Eventually the little ones were up on their knees, up on their feet, and they were running and they were leaping and they were reaching. And they were reaching. So in my tradition, our highest activity is to be reaching to be reaching for those visions that our young ones need, their learning spirits need. And so we take up our practices. We take up our remaking of ourselves, what I call through indigenous poesis, to be, and we rinse our ears and we wash our eyes and we crack open our hearts because we know that the teachings of our time are not sufficient for the little ones and that they came to be reaching for a vision that is actually to do with the healing and well-being of us all. Chimikwich. Thank you very much, Vicki. Uh, really, I, you truly are a, a wonderful storyteller. Every time I hear your words, uh, I hear your stories, it, uh, you know, it's, your words are so evocative, uh, your, uh, your wisdom warms my heart, and, you know, your, your message, as you say in your own word, animates my mind. So thank you very much for sharing. As we, uh, I know it's going to be hard, I think we should all just take a pause and reflect on uh, Vicky's wise words about the importance of reaching up and forward, especially for those our youth and those who are coming after us. So thank you for those wise words, Vicky. 
Ah, so after uh, further, much further ado, I think we will go on to Nathalie. Uh, she's presently in France, so I know she's a good seven or eight or nine hours ahead of us. So I hope we're not keeping you up too, too much, Nathalie, but we are all here and uh, looking forward to hearing from you. So please go ahead, Nathalie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the speech are amazing and, and uh, uh, yeah, Vicky uh, testimony is wonderful. Well, now we are going to Tibet. Um, okay, it's working, yes. You hear me? Everything is correct? Yes? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I acknowledge everyone for the invitation to speak about my collaboration with Lobsang Shanzo, artist from Tibet, for a show on which we are working with, um, with his band uh, Kab Yulsa. This collaboration was born from an article I wrote in French for the Journal of Ethnomusicology entitled The Seeds of Tibetan Exile from Intimate Journey to Collective Destiny. Um, I followed the singular journey of a Tibetan artist exiled in France, Lobsang Chonzor. To do this, I conducted several interviews with him and followed his individual paths uh, that I compared with that the Tibet in recent years. Today, I will speak, uh, uh, I will tell you uh, about the Tibetan refugees in France, their musical and stage creation, and my collaboration with Lobsang Chonzor on a show on which we are working together. Tibetan musical creation in exile covers a wide range of styles and practice borrowing from live performance, ritual performative practice, contemporary music such as folk, folk rap, progressive rock, experimental music, multimedia experiences, and finally to the world of fusion network. A part of this identity in exile was built and promoted by the Central Tibetan Administration through the Tibetan, uh, Tibetan Institute of Performing Arts, created by the Dalai Lama in the early hours in his ex uh, in exile in 1959. It illustrates a continuum of practices and uses of the music by registering in a framework and a space of artistic production contingent on the history of the Tibetan diaspora in India. Lapsang Chonzo, for example, uh, is in vogue between two words, his membership in the Tibetan community in exile in India and then in France, and his statue as a full artist in France illustrated this reconfiguration of the professional trajectories of artists in a situation of migration and the creative processes at work in music. The many scenic and musical expressions given to see and hear within the exiled communities testify to an attachment a sense of belonging to a singular civilization and a strong identity matrix. These performative hearts emanate from a very vast geographical and cultural stock difficult to circumscribe. Since 1965, it is common to designate uh, by Tibet the only autonomous uh, I'm sorry, the, the map is in French, but um, I think it's easier to understand. This is what we call nowadays Tibet, I show here. Uh, but uh, ethnographically, Tibet is bigger. You can see here King Hai, uh, a little bit Gansu, uh, Sichuan. And so uh, for the Tibetans, 
they say it's the three provinces, Yutsang in the center of Tibet, Kham, the east, and Ando, northeast. An area about 2.5 million square kilometers, which is five times the total area of France. The Tibetan territory represents the southwestern quarter of China, and it is about 6 million Tibetans. Since the escape of the 14th Dalai Lama, Tenzin Gyatso, to India in 1959, several waves of migration have occurred in South Asia and then in the West, including France. The Tibetan population in exile is estimated at 150,000 people in South Asia, India, Nepal, Bhutan, and between five and 6,000 in France, mainly in Paris region. Despite their migration in very difficult conditions, material difficulties on arrival and adaptation to a new country like India and the new climate, uh, refugee camps are considered by the scholars as a success stories of adaptation and pre preservation, construction of a unified Tibetan identity. As a result, 90% of children are in school and 73 Tibetan schools are authorized by India. They learn Tibetan standard language because there are a multitude of languages and dialects in Tibet, receive a nationalist uh, education, Tibetan history and civilization, religious daily prayers, and practice singing, music, and dance. In France, the number of Tibetan refugees has increased in the last year, 10 years, from 700, 2008, to 6,000 in 2018 in migging crimes from Syria, Afghanistan, Eritrea, have been added Tibetan Niagara camps, living under tent or bridges. Um, uh, uh, sorry, especially near Paris in the evening. Thus, several generations of Tibetans from different waves of migration are currently found in France. A certain solidarity and community life animate the daily life of these refugees, where songs, music, and dance, as well as a great diversity of artistic expressions, embellish their daily life as refugees. Sunday picnics, where they sing and dance, celebration of the Losa, Tibetan New Year's, several Tibetan festivals in France, many pro-Tibet events and celebrations of the Dalai Lama birthday. Troops of Tibetans regularly perform on stage of this diaspora based, based mainly in Paris. Uh, such are those of the Tibetan artists in France. Among the Tibetans in exiles, two Tibetans are recognized as professional artists by the French compensation system and make reference figure, Tenzin Gampo and Lobsang Chanzo. The first was born in Tibet in 1955. He immigrated to India in 1960 and he moved to France in 1990, where he pursued a career as a professional musician, creates a show, composes with his own melody, and collaborates with filmmakers like Jean-Jacques Hannault for the movie Seven Years in Tibet, or Martin, Martin Scorsese for Kunden. Lobson Chanzo was born in India in 1976, and is from the exiled Tibetan community of Kalipong. He represents a transition between the traditional Tibetan repertoire based on the program offered by the Tibetan Institute of Performing Arts, which it's mattered perfectly and an artistic creation fairly anchored in the contemporary world, both are personal and fruit of various collaboration. As I said before, Lobsang Chanzo grows up at the crossroads of a lot of influences. 
he really admits that he was not attracted at the first time by the music, songs, and traditional dances uh, taught in his Tibetan school. Nor was he fascinated by this group of musicians and dancers who sometimes came to perform in his school. The trigger occurs at the nine of eight, nine years old, when his father asked him to interpret the drum dance, a very physical dance, he told me. It was for me a revelation, a kind of yoga, physically, mentally, and spiritually, which gave me a total well-being, a source of joy, and motivation to continue exploring the dance. He trained with the Tibetan Institute Performing Art Professor while pursuing his studies in parallel is in artistic activity because he justifies in India, the status of artist is not the same as in France. Sported for his qualities as a dancer and a musician, he was 20 years old when his teacher asked him to teach in parallel with his studies at the university. Recognized and accomplished artist, he continues his training through his meeting with other artists during tours in India and abroad. In 2006, he was invited in France for, to participate as a dancer in the festival Residence of the World organized by the Young International Theatre of Valenciennes in the north of France. Luxong accepts and meets with other artists from Greenland, Senegal, Turkey, Ethiopia, Australia, Kyrgyzstan, the North American First Nations, Mexico, and Sri Lanka with a great artistic curiosity. This first French experience included performance of singing, music, and dance to promote traditional Tibetan arts, uh, as well as introductory workshop to Tibetan songs, dances, and music in educational and cultural institution. In 2007, he was invited again to perform at a festival of white culture in Valenciennes, still in the north of France. He has for two months leave for in, of absence from his employer in India, which refuses him. After many reflections, hesitation, and consultation of astrologers, Lord Song decided to leave exclusively from his art and leave his work with, uh, with, without notice. 2008 was the decisive year of the installation in France under the sign of love and a wedding with his French girlfriend. He multiplies the project, the concert in solo or in group, the master class or in the conservatories, schools of music, universities, cultural institutions, and scenic experiences uh, with the story, for example, with the story of the cadaver a Tibetan uh, uh, story in collaboration with the storyteller Sophie Perez. Then come the project Kabyusa, Resonance of Exile. Kab in Tibetan means exile and Yulsa the earth. Kabyusa will thus translate as land of exile or land of exiles. He desires to explore the instrumental, musical, and melodic possibilities of tri uh, Tibetan traditional music in interaction with other instruments. Lopsang felt melodically limited with the Tibetan Dranian lute, which does not offer enough tones. Indeed, this instrument has only six strings organized in three chore and turned in La, Ré, Sol. Broadening the repertoire to other songs and musical arrangement seems a new path through creative potentials to explore with the appropriation and the transposition of other musical universes applied to the music of Tibetan tradition. Tradition, excuse me. Uh, Lopsong told me, 
Of course, all the songs are in Tibetan, but did not want to exclusively adapt Tibetan music, rather to establish a real dialogue between our musical words. The interest for me was to play tempanon with this orchestration, because Tibetans are not used to this kind of song. We nevertheless kept and made arrangement from the original score for all Tibetan tunes. He decided to create a new band with the violinist Margot Lienard, expert in classical music jazz, music from Ireland and Northern Europe, and the percussionist uh, Julien Lahaye, wizard, drums on the Middle East and Maghreb, as the DAF, the Bandir, the Rig, and so on. This new group is mainly uh, on the Tibetan repertoire. Kyabusa, uh, Resonance of Exile, made a great success on tour, and critics are laudatory on the part of the public. This type of collaboration with musicians from all um, walks of life is common. If you look at the Medi, many adaptations of a Tibetan song called Akupema that you can find on YouTube, including one by Lotem Langling, for example, in the Folk Theatre Oslo in Norway, with Ildegun Oset, a Norwegian um, jazz musician playing got on, and various, types of the various types of trumpets, and Kwame Sereba, a percussionist and a singer from Ivory Coast. His musical sharing, his collaboration are understood as an oscillation between recovery and innovation. We can find another example with Tenzin Shogyal, who collaborates with experimental musicians such as Philip Glass and uh, Laurie Anderson. About my collaboration with Love Song, first of all, you must know that my research for my PhD was about the sacred dances of Tibet. I started a first ethnographic field in India within the Tibetan community in exile in Dharamsala in 2000. It was on that occasion that I learned about Tibetan Buddhism by performing a spiritual retreat in a Buddhist center. I was then asked to serve as an English-French interpreter for high ranking Yufuji Lama, the 17 Kamapa. And then I worked for 12 years in Sachin Monastery, a Tibetan Buddhist monastery rebuilt in Nepal between 2002 uh, and uh, between 2002 and, and, and I went regularly to study the sacred Buddhist performance. Then I work in the epic Geza Hofling uh, when uh, I went to Tibet. I meet Lam Tsang in France uh, at the invitation to a French association that campaigns for the Tibetan cause. He gave a show of Tibetan dance, singing and music. I was very impressed by this stage presence. Then I invited him to give a master class in my university. And throughout these years, we maintained a strong friendship. Uh, last year, I published this article on the music of Tibetan refugees in France. And Love Song Life uh, uh, had served me as an example. This summer, his, pro his production company offered me to write a stage libretto for his next musical show. Having been a professional director before starting my university, my university studies, I was delighted to accept this proposal that makes the link between my artistic and academic career. I proceed as I done for my ethnographic work by collecting Lobsang's word. The story of his life and the life of his parents will be the main theme of the show from the exiles of these parents, from Tibet to India until his arrival in France, his training, his musical and cultural heritage, his, his, his exile, and in his source of inspiration. Text read carried by the artist, 
uh, shed light on the artistic purpose of the trio because I'm still working with Love Song and the trio Kyabulsa. This creation is an opportunity to discover Tibetan culture with Love Song Chanzo and to open a door uh, to other horizons carried by Margot Lienard and Julien Lahaye. This is a sensitive approach, a collection of the artist's speech and knowledge of the Tibetan world with my university education. The stage libretto will contain texts in reference to the life of Lobsang, historical references, geographical and ethnographic on the daily life of Tibetan in Tibet and in exile, and also including translation of the text song in the show. The life stories will be told by Lobsang himself on stage. The show is thought to be an echo between the individual destiny of an artist and the story of his people, his ancestral way of life, his tradition, and then his openness to the world. We will embark, as I show with the picture of a Tibetan nomad friend, um, we will embark for the Tibetan island with the song of Kam and Amdo, those Tibetan regions where people live in harmony with the elements of nature considered as deities, a pastoral and a nomadic society. We will follow the prayer milestones to the sound of the six mantra syllab, Omani Peme Hom, and that spread peace and compassion. The journey continues with the time and the constraint and the odyssey of exiled Tibetan crossing snow-covered mountains, far from their homeland. The songs of exile evoke the nostalgia of the family, the inenterrable face, the landscapes and the joy of yesteryear. Joy returns to the culture of the world in the spirit of the exchange and transmission. For me, it was a kind of illustration of the mandala of life. We have started the rehearsals and the show, uh, the first, the premiere, is scheduled from November 20, uh, 2021. Just to end this presentation, I will make you listen to a short musical extract from the last rehearsal we have, and it is just the beginning of our performance. This is an evocation to uh, uh, the eighties. Much. Oh, thank you, Nathalie. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, thank you, Nathalie, so much for sharing your collaborations, your story with Lok Son Chongso. Um, and uh, we wish you the best of luck with the libretto that you are performing with him. I think that your work, you know, is situated very well within Virginie's examination of the power of vocality and, and you know, Vicky's journey as she is seeking to reanimate songs, practices, and knowledges in Indigenous pedagogy. So thank you very much for that. Um, we do have uh, around 10 minutes or so for questions, um, comments to any of our three presenters. Um, I know that Liz is going to be um, looking after this section, but if any one of you would like to make a comment, please feel free to, uh, yes, just unmute and uh, share our thoughts, ideas uh, with our presenters. Go ahead, Winston. Uh, Winston, um, you have to unmute. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, very, very enjoyable. You're a very good moderator. Oh, I wanted to ask a question to you. I wanted to tell you something. I was up north along the coast there about uh, maybe five years ago, and uh, I was talking to all, many, many Aboriginals came in there. But you're your people, like, and uh, I was I was with my drum, and I had an extra drum, and if somebody wanted a drum, I was going to let them play that drum. So as I was going in, they had asked me to do a, a prayer song, like a blessing. So I told that man, I said, "Here, I said, you take this drum and you play this drum, and I will play this drum." And so I went in and I played the drum and I sang, and then uh, gave the blessing, and then afterwards. He was, we were all, everybody had a chance to talk out there. And so that man said, you know, I'm about 60 years old. This is the first time in my life I ever held a drum. Mm -hmm. It's the first time. And he said, all my life, I was brought up in the church and I was told that native stuff was bad. He said, but today, he said, I played the drum. It was beautiful. I loved it. I finally feel like I am a person. And he looked around and he said, and I'm with my people. Hmm. And I thought to myself, that's true, you know, because when you play the drum and you're with your people, all of a sudden you are with your people and you're either playing or you're listening to the classical music of North America. And I thought to myself, as he played, it seems to me as I looked outside, everything became alive. Even the mountains, everything was there. There's so much power there. But I never ever forget that man because he was, he said that, but he, you know, that was the first time that he, he felt comfortable in his life. Hmm. Anyway, thank you very much. I uh, raise my hands to you for, for your story, beautiful stories. Thank you very much, Winston. At this point, are there any other questions that we have for, yes, please go ahead, Barbara. Thank you so much. I want to thank the three speakers for three really fascinating presentations. And I just have to say, I, I'm a theater professor. I have a specialty in voice and mindfulness and musical theater, but I'm also a singer and I sing with my synagogue choir. And I have always found singing to be what connects me to spirituality, that and walking in the woods, which I do every day. But it, there's something, I, I won't say I've had a mystical experience while singing, but singing deeply religious music, um, and we don't always sing deeply religious music, but singing in the Yom Kippur service, for example, which is the Day of Atonement, a very solemn, holy day. Singing the liturgical music, standing next to our cantor, with other members of the choir, and somebody used the words, I think it was Virginie, the, the interweaving of the voices. I mean, you just feel that you become something beyond yourself. And the sense of the tradition and the tradition being passed, and it's just really extraordinary. I mean, it's just, it's, it's physiological, it's psychological, it's, it just has so many dimensions. And I, I'm fascinated. I'm, as soon as this is over, I'm buying your book, Virginie. So and I'll make sure our library has it too at Tufts. So thank you so much. And can I ask a question? I actually, 
I'm so grateful to you, Vicky, because I've always loved Native American flute music. I mean, I know more American, um, United States, let's call us Carlos Nakai, mm -hmm. which I discovered in when I was in New Mexico years ago. But um, and it was the, the most effective way to get my then young children to sleep mm -hmm. playing that. But when you talk about we can wash our eyes, rinse our ears, I was interested in the use of the of the word rinse. Could you just is it just simply just getting the gunk out of our ears so we can be open or mm, I I think for me it's the washing, you know, the washing of um and and I do think many of our ceremonies are that we brush with cedar, we smudge, we rinse, you know, we we do these processes that um clean I'm going to say, but I am a great lover of, of Gerard Manley Hopkins, and he says, the song does so rinse and wring my ear, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And I think that in the listening, our, it's like our ears can, um, you know, it's, a, it's actually moving. You know, we, are, we have a very mechanistic way of thinking, but actually our ears are, um, it, are being responded to like the drum, in a sense. So when you play a drum, and another drum is sitting there, the, that resonance uh, animates that drum. And so I do believe that authentic sound does rinse and wring our ears mm. because we're, we've been digitalized and I think it's very important that we reanimate uh, original sound. Uh, as Winston has spoken that the power of the drum is such a very, very powerful uh, instrument, the way that it it affects the human being, because it is the heartbeat. Um, and in the Anishinaabe tradition, we have this tradition that everything began with sound. There is a creation story that is that it all began with sound, not image, but sound. And in that sounding, the heartbeat of the creator animates the is that that's energy that animates all things and is represented or represented in every ceremony with a drum and we also have this tradition that in the first sound when the when the thunder went out into the world um, then what happened it was there was this uh, sound like sh seeds in a gourd this shaking of these animated seeds of life. And we have honor that tradition in our rattles. And so we must remember that the cosmology is written into our instruments, mm -hmm. that the sounds um, do awaken in us like they did our ancestors, part of our humanness. And I believe they're pr profoundly pedagogical to us. And I think, um, you know, uh, the sounds of healing by Mitchell Gaynor, when he talks about you know, this understanding, the cosmology of sound. Uh, I work with what I call the epistemology, acoustic episto acoustemology, where, where the world is ordered and knowledge actually lives in sound, not only in epistem, which is a visual metaphor for knowledge. And so I think we, 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 become, um, we become in a way deaf uh, to the voices of our relatives and the way that it speaks or they speak through sound. And we can't find our voicing in the ecology of voices uh, because we've, um, we've bec the anthropocentricnesses of our cultures have made our voice so prevalent. We're not listening, we're not paying attention. And so I believe that these songs from our ancestors help us to tune our ears and tune our hearts and souls in important ways. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Yes, thank you. Uh, I believe it is 1230 now, Karen, would you like to, to close? Yes, thank you. Um, so I think this is a very fitting occasion. Vicki has also offered to uh, close uh, with one of her beautiful flute renditions. So I want to thank you all on behalf of the Centre for Mindful Engagement, on behalf of all our research cluster on culture, creativity, health and well-being. I want to recognize that Konstantinos is here, I think from the UK. Mm -hmm where you're at Constantino and Rena is here as well good Rina. to see you Hello, thank you all and I will hand it over to Vicky to conclude Vicky whenever you're ready so I just want to show you what I'm playing 
So it's um, a flute times two. And um, for me, it is the best experience of what this acoustic ecology is about. And I'm going to play in the beginning um, an honor song to our elders and our knowledge holders and our ancestors. Thank you, Vicki, and thanks to all of you for joining us. And our webinar will come to a conclusion. Goodbye, everybody. See you later. Please do keep in touch. Take care.